Hello everyone and welcome to our seventh seminar of the series From Single to Mingle in just under 30 seconds, the how-tos in deciphering the dating code. Today, we will help you find your Mr. and Mrs. Wright and provide you with the tools needed to be successful in your journey. Many of you probably came across my TV show, The Happiness Journey with Dr. Dan, where I invite guests from all walks of life to share their journeys in overcoming difficult challenges in their lives and managing to keep moving forward despite the odds. So how do you define happiness? Now we all have a different definition to what happiness means to us, individually speaking. For some, it's a huge mention by the ocean, while others would prefer excellent health and longevity. Now most of us also look for that special someone to spend their life with. Now once you find that person, it takes time, effort, and patience to keep the relationship joyful and long-lasting. Today, we will talk about the tools needed to find that special someone. Now I have brought guests with extensive knowledge in the field of dating and relationship. They are here to share their expertise with us. My name is Dr. Dan and I'm your host for today's seminar. I have a doctorate degree in organizational leadership and communication with a minor in quantum physics. I'm also practicing therapist covering issues such as self-esteem, weight and anger management and also do marital and relationship counseling. I do individual and group therapy as well. For more information, you can contact me at the number below. Now, it is time to introduce my guest for today's seminar. We have Tova Rubin, Dr. Phil, <laughs> we have Marilyn, and we have Robin Smith. Now, they're all here to be able to share with all of us their extensive knowledge about the how-to in finding Mr. and Mrs. Wright. So Tova, we're gonna start with you. Tell me more about yourself and to the audience. I'm Dr. Tova Rubin, <coughs> and I've been in practice about 14 years. I do individual psychotherapy and couples work, and relationships are almost always at the center of the work that we do. And I'm really excited to be here, so thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much for being here, Doc. I'm Philip Reynolds. I do uh, private practice psychotherapy, but also some more intensive in-home supports for really troubled relationships, um, things of that nature. And I've been doing this for about 12, 13 years now, so I'm really happy to be here as well. Thank you, Doc. Hi, my name is Marilyn Spenadel, and I'm a, a licensed clinical professional counselor in Rockville. And my company's called Authentically You Counseling, and I just opened up also in conjunction with this Holistic Wellness Enrichment Center to teach. I teach a lot of workshops at University Shady Grove, and um, I'm bringing it into the community to help have us all have some, a sense of wellness and oneness and. Um, trying to teach more about compassion and, and speaking from the heart to help families, cult cross cultures, and um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Hey, Dan. Well. So uh, I'm Robin Smith. Uh, I'm a marriage and family therapist. Um, I practice in Bethesda. Uh, I've been in practice for about five years, and um, uh, even though I, s I see individuals, couples, and families, I really specialize working with couples. So I love uh, working with relationships and treating the relationship itself. Thank you all. Thank you so much all for being here today. I'm really happy to have you guys. And we're going to start with the questions and also <coughs> the audience that we have here will get involved because this is an interactive seminar and they will ask you questions. So I have no control over those. Okay. So Tova, well, I'm going to start with you. Um, when it comes to um, the common mistakes when people, f uh, when they choose their significant other or their partner, what are the common mistakes that they uh, venture in? It's a great question. I, I think a common mistake is looking for the perfect other person. Because <coughs> really, it really is more about creating a strong relationship together. And sometimes it's easier to say what's wrong with the other person than it is to look at ourselves. I think it's important to look for someone that shares interests, shares values. Uh, sometimes early on when we're dating, we look for opposites. But that's much harder to sustain than someone that's more like us. And so I think it's also helpful to find someone that's like you, someone that likes your friends, someone that your family likes. So don't opposite attracts? <coughs> they do attract, but they don't necessarily last that long. Okay, excellent, well thank you. Uh, Phil, now when it comes to uh, marriage problems or married couples, um, they deal with what you could say like the 
what are their roots when it comes to dating someone? Like, if you base yourself with your parents, for example, mm -hmm. if they've been together for 45 years, do the kids supposed to like kind of get in, uh, inspired by what works with them, or how do they work when it comes to looking for someone else? Um, I think that oftentimes when you find <coughs> married couples, and all married couples typically start out as dating couples as well, um, that our parents do have a significant impact on us. Um, and I think, you know, prior to getting ready and getting out there and dating, being able to understand how that may have played a role, we kind of default to, and if you look at a lot of marriages down the line, it's like, huh, this looks a lot like my parents' relationship, or I'm operating like mom or dad. And so I think doing some of that work early on, um, by the time they get to be married couples and they're down the line, you know, you're looking at some of the damage that you've done because, well, I've been trying to look at my spouse as my mother figure or my mm -hmm. father figure and some of that. So I think cleaning up a lot of that prior to marriage could be useful for you. But when it comes to the childhood, like when you've been raised by your parents, either the family or the, if there was a dynamic was toxic or not toxic, right. do they kind of uh, reiterate that same uh, issue with their future relationship? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think that it's uh, absolutely intentional, and people have different resiliency. So you find some that uh, live their life and their dating relationships trying to have the exact opposite of what they saw in their parents, mm -hmm. and then some that end up modeling exactly what. Um, their parents' relationship look like instead of getting to a point of being authentically themselves and being able to live that out in their relationships, not burdened with maybe the baggage of their parents' relationships, what they saw or didn't see, figuring out what's healthy and moving in that direction. But that baggage, is, is it can be really rough. Yes, I, I do get that. Now, Marilyn, um, you mentioned about you need to know yourself first before you could even look for someone or even understand what the other person, if the other person will be good for you. Right. How much really soul searching do you have to do before you feel ready to be able to go out there? I think maybe later in life people need to do more of it. I, I was lucky with my, with my husband, we've been married for 31 years, and I, don't, I think I know myself so much better now. But I think as people get older and maybe their second marriage, um, even more so, you need to go in and, and find what's your true self, what makes you happy, because if you're all, and also validating yourself and healing your emotional triggers that maybe came from childhood, right? You need mm -hmm. to do that, because then, if, and then if you're always looking for valid validation with this person, you know, and for them to lift you up, then you're gonna be looking forever, because you need to give it to yourself first, and heal yourself, and just accept yourself, and you know, be as assertive as you can to find the right person, and not be searching so much for them, just to, just to live in the moment, and live your true self, and, and figure out your passion, I think is important you know, to really have a good life. If you're always looking for someone, it's not gonna happen. But I think if you're just doing you and just loving you know, you and your relationship with your friends and something will happen, it will come along when you least expect it, I've seen. But because of past relationship also, yeah. don't people <coughs> take their problems that they had on the previous one and put it on the new one? So how, was, right. how much time do they have to give themselves before to say, I'm ready to jump back into finding someone else? That's a good question. They shouldn't jump, they shouldn't jump back and, 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 and um, um, do it because they just they, they need I've had club, some people come see me because they need the validation they need 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 but then they're always going to be looking they need to find themselves mm -hmm. and be just so comfortable with their own skin and their own skin you know and their own heart and be able to love others and love themselves just to feel ready you know like that but you're right people get triggered all the time too yes. right you're so right. come see me I do advanced integrative therapy helping people let go of their past so then they can bring in new new core beliefs um, because if you're always holding on to your past and in your drama, you're never going to find the right person. <laughs> and there's a lot of drama. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> now, Robin, yeah. when it comes to looking for special traits in other <coughs> people, in a partner, um, is there like a certain path that you have to take? Do you have to start learning more about what you enjoy the most about yourself and kind of like throw it into that other person, but then you look too much for someone who's too similar? What kind of traits would you recommend? Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess that depends on the person, the person looking. Um, because the, the, I guess there's, there's traits that we know are good and healthy in relationships. So traits such as openness, honesty, right? Communication. Um, yeah, com well, communication. I, I would say, I mean, just based on the, the work that I do and what I see, um, one of the most important traits is the ability to um, keep yourself regulated. 
keep yourself, um, you know, as other guests had talked about, being, when, being, when we're activated or when we're emotionally dysregulated, we can kind of let our emotions get the better of us. And that doesn't, it's not to say that we should ignore our emotions or suppress them, um, but when we're really heated and oftentimes in relationships that are not going so well, there's high levels of criticism, high levels of defensiveness and contempt and stonewalling and people just, you know, that's the end of the argument, I'm out of here. Um, and that's because their, their nervous system is on fire. And so I think, you know, one of the traits, if I were single and I were dating right now, I would pay attention to how I was feeling in that first date. I would pay attention to, um, you know, second date, third date, as I was getting to know this person, how are they uh, managing themselves in terms of being, well, being open, being honest, but also how are they reacting when we're, when we're not getting along and disagreeing, so. And how much honesty should you have on the first date? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. So <laughs> I remember like um, Chris Rock has this really good uh, s uh, bit where he talks about on the first date, you're not really meeting the person, you're meeting their representative. You know, we all, <laughs> we all, you're the best, you, we put our best self forward. Um, so I, I don't know if I really am the guy to ask about what is the best, how level of, you know, the Goldilocks zone uh, of uh, honesty. But f certainly for relationships that are going to last uh, a long time, um, you're not doing yourself any favors by being dishonest with your partner, by hiding, by lying. Um, and you're not, doing, you know, you're not doing the relationship any favors, and you're not doing yourself any favors by, by lying to yourself sometimes, too. Interesting. You know, I think it's not just, um, it's not always an intentional lie, right? Because sometimes we present a part of ourselves, and it's a genuine part of ourselves, um, and it's the best part of ourselves. And then later on, other parts of ourselves emerge mm -hmm. uh, when we're deeper into it. So I think it's hard sometimes, yeah, there's straight out lying, you know, and saying you're a different age or a different situation. That's going to be found out. Mm -hmm. But I think the more discovering the deeper parts of ourselves that are, don't show up in that honeymoon period of dating is really the interesting part of the where you have to hang in there a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Well, I think when you said, you know, um, how honest should you be on the first date, you should be 100% honest, but you don't have to share everything, right? <laughs> you're, not, you're not disclosing all the information that there is to disclose. I didn't, you know, change my underwear before I came on this date. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's not something that you have to say. Not and, to get you know, political, but you don't have to share your tax returns. Right, right, yeah. Yeah. right, those kind Unlike of things. Trump. Right, <laughs> so, so I, I think <laughs> honesty is an important quality, and, you know, on a date, I mean, sometimes you can pick that up and tell when you feel like somebody's being mm -hmm. a little, you know, evasive Safe. when you're asking questions, and that's mm -hmm. gonna be an automatic turnoff. But I think being genuine and honest about what's going on is 100%. Um, you just don't have to disclose everything. Mm. It's keep it for the second date. Right, <laughs> save it for the second date. I mean, if you're not taking your pants off to the third date, yeah, okay. you can keep some <laughs> things back until at least then. <laughs> Interesting. Now, if we keep this, um, this kind of count topic here, what are the red flags, Tova, that you would, when you meet someone first, like what will trigger to say, oh, there's something odd, mentally yeah. odd with this person? Yeah, I, when I have a client who's dating, and they come in and they say, you know, I went out on this date and they start telling me about it. Uh, some red flags are, first of all, if they're secretive and you don't feel like being honest. Also, as you're dating someone, if they don't want you to meet their friends, if they don't introduce you to anybody they know, mm. that's a really big red flag that there's something, you know, not completely right going on. Uh, if they just talk about themselves yes. and never ask you anything about you, even if they're really interesting and fun, it's, it seems a little one way. One eighty percent of the day they're looking at their phone. Or if they're looking at their phone the whole time and doing some Facebook yeah, status, yeah. stuff or Tinder, <laughs> you know, looking for the next date while wow. they're sitting there with the you. Tinder, not, they swipe not a good sign. <laughs> not a good sign. So those are some of the red flags, I think. Has anyone here in the audience have experienced those kind of red flags when they went up to the first date? We'd like to have your feedback. I'm sure that you've faced some red flags before, haven't you? Anyone? No? Everyone had the perfect first date? <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, it's, it must be something uh, that was not right. Mm -hmm. Anyone would like to share that uh, with us? I'm sure that the, the professionals here will be able to give you guidance in knowing what not to say on the second date or the first date. Well, you may be asking the wrong question because maybe they're the ones that have been the red flag. On the first <laughs> well, okay, here you go. Yeah, that, you know, I looked at it one angle. Right, right, you're right. right. So who was the red actually. flag on that? Right, thing? right. <laughs> who who <laughs> overshared? You who know? overshared? Yes. <laughs> if anyone wants, they could just stand up here, or uh, 
No? Oh, okay, we could move on then. Okay, <laughs> okay Phil. Um, how, now we're talking about intuition. We right. just kind of like uh, hit the topic here. How can you trust it? I know that the little voice inside you would say, this person is like odd, mm -hmm. you should never call them again. Or would you say, you know what, I'm gonna give the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. To what extent would you go? I think that ties into kind of knowing yourself. If that little voice in your head comes up because of your own issues versus something you're actually picking up with the other person. And so, you know, to be prepared for dating, you have to have a good understanding of your own self. Then I think there are going to be those little red flags. So, you know, if, if I'm a woman out on a date with a guy and, you know, there's no courtesy, right? You know, um, there's no you know, something's going on in the corner and he's paying more attention to that than he is to me. I mean, those things are little red flags that should send your alarms off and I think you pay attention to that. You pay attention to what's going on. Um, you know, guy, if the girl doesn't seem really interested, if something seems off, um, you know, I think you pay attention to those things. Mm -hmm. Now, the level of, you know, severity, I think that would determine something. You're walking to your car and he, you know, sends you to the car by yourself and it's <laughs> dark out, you know, okay we're probably not doing a second date, right? Mm -hmm. if he For seems some women, other women might appreciate the independence mm -hmm. and right. that he's giving her space to Or even to herself. check, okay, are you comfortable doing mm -hmm. this? I mm -hmm. think just showing mm -hmm. that genuine care and concern, you know, something that... Or takes when they get home to say, did you arrive safe and sound? Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. something okay. along those lines. But mm -hmm. if there's no, you know, text, phone call, it's been a couple days, well... You kind of use your intuition there, you kind of go with <laughs> it. Um, typically, I find that when clients come in, those red flags that they're now recalling after six months or a year of dating somebody were there from the very beginning, they just mm -hmm. ignored them. And so, mm -hmm. you know, again, mm -hmm. is this me? Is this my own internal alarm going off because of my own issues? Or is there something here that's real that I need to pay attention to? And oftentimes, a lot of people ignore that. But this seems good, or I want this to be good, or I'm 36 and I kind of want to be married. And so they're not even. I was about to ask you yeah, that question. They're actually. not really yeah. ignoring it as much as really just rationalizing it away, right? Right. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Which can be tough. So past experience should not cloud your judgment when it comes to giving a chance to someone else. It shouldn't cloud your judgment, but it's all part of a feedback process that you have because I mean mm -hmm. we typically will gravitate towards the same kind of people. Yeah. Right, and so maybe again, there's something wrong with me that I keep dating, and the last three people I've dated <laughs> all seem to be like this. Then, mm -hmm. then that's mm -hmm. my issue, right? There's something going yeah. on with me. So past experience could cloud because you think, okay, well, this one's just different, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's and it's really not. So I think it's mm -hmm. all part of a feedback loop, and I think it's important to have good friends that can be honest with you about what you're seeing and hearing. And a lot of times, we can even ignore those friends. Yes. Oh, this seems like a red flag. This seems like you shouldn't be going out on this date again. But then. There you are, <laughs> and six months down the line, it went the exact same way, you know. So really, being able to listen to, hear, have good people to give you feedback, and trust your friends. Interesting, Marilyn. Um, as we all know, we all have an energy signature. It's like a big transmission tower, okay? And we get along with certain people, and with others, we know that they're toxic. Now, if I ask you the question when it comes to understanding someone else's energy. Okay, mm -hmm. and when you start thinking about, hey, you know what? I need to change them in your image. Mm -hmm. So when you start changing them, mm. they're no longer Mr. or Mrs. Right. Mm -hmm. They're Mr. or Mrs. Right, depending on how you perceive them. Mm -hmm. So how do you go with that strong desire in wanting to change someone? Mm -hmm. Then you mean from this point forward, they're no longer the person that you want them to be. Well. Good question. But if you want to change someone, why are you putting so much effort into being with them? If it's work, it shouldn't be work. It should be easy. Well, relationship is work. Marriage is a lot of work. It's work, yeah, but it, it shouldn't feel so yucky inside or so, you know, toxic like you're saying. If the person's toxic to you, then find out why. Step back and say, why is this happening over and over? If it's a trigger that you feel inside, get help. See a therapist. Why are you feeling this? Or have them get help. Is that what you're trying to say? Well, I mean, in, in somehow, yes. But when it comes to like people when they go on a date okay and they get into a relationship right, right. and they feel that the relationship is not up to what or maybe the person is like a slob mm -hmm. they leave things on the floor mm -hmm. and so on and so forth and that person wants to change to say hey you know I what see. clean after yourself or clean this or, but they're not like that 
they're just a slob by nature. Mm -hmm. So when you start wanting to change someone, mm -hmm. then that person no longer a Mr. or Mrs. Right. So how much change should you put on someone else to decide mm -hmm. if they're the right person for you? Wow, or how much change should you want from someone? Yes. That's a good question. Well, if they're interested in, in, in growing and, and becoming more of what you want them to be, that's, that's tough. Like, you know, it's not our job to mold somebody, but to yes, love exactly. them, to love them even words and all, you know, to be okay with their imperfections. Who they are. Yeah, exactly, because no one's <coughs> perfect, right? Well, we're all trying to find the perfect person for ourselves. Right. Not the perfect person right. that is for everyone. Right. So. You know, the Gottman's work, the famous mm -hmm. couples researchers talked about, you know, wh when you try to change someone, you actually make them more entrenched in how they've always been. And the more you accept someone, ironically, paradoxically, the more they change. Mm -hmm. wow, and so, nice. you know, if somebody's a slob, um, I'm not the neatest person. <laughs> and, you know, my husband's pretty neat. And for the first bunch of years of our marriage, he was always trying to get me to be neater. And, you know, just say, you know, you're going to have to just accept this. But as soon as he, instead of doing that, mm -hmm. he could just kind of give up on that. I was more inspired to do it and just, I probably did it more because I didn't feel like I, I didn't feel like I had to push back. I, did, I could be accepted for the way I was. So I think when we try to change someone, ironically, we're pushing them away. Mm. We're saying, I'll only love you if you change. Then they're going to test that. That's right. Wow. Or you're saying, I, I'm, I only love these parts of you. I don't, right. I don't accept you just as you are. Right. Yeah, I, was, I wanted to piggyback in on that and say that, you know, when we're talking about change in a relationship, and this may be like, you know, the long view, but obvi obviously uh, my assumption here is that when we're going on a date, we're looking for a partner for the rest of our lives. Now, maybe that's not everyone's goal, but usually that's what we're looking mm -hmm. for. And to be with someone over the course of a lifetime means to be flexible and, and to adjust because people change. <laughs> careers change, identities change, you know, you become a parent, like suddenly your priorities are different. So you, the, the relationship system itself has to be able to make adjustments and you as a participant in that relationship, you as a partner, have to be flexible and, and not so rigid to say, this is, this is only the, the way I'll be or I only want to be with people who are this way. If you're going to operate that way, it's you're, <laughs> good luck, right? <laughs> um, be single for a while. Yeah. The other thing that I like to say, and I certainly don't want to, to go uh, too deep, you know, stop me if I get in too much into therapist mode, right, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a dating show, but um, I say to my clients all the time, uh, you know, it might be an accident or it might be random how you two met each other, how you two found each other, but it is certainly not an accident that you chose to stay with one another. Uh, there are, <laughs> when we talk about childhood and adolescence, there are forces at work, you know, um, unconscious forces at work behind the scenes that are telling you there's something about this person that's familiar. There's something about them. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, Oedipus complex, you know, I'm marrying my mom or I'm, I'm marrying my dad. <laughs> Not necessarily, right? Some people don't grow up with their parents. But there is something in our past in how we're raised that is familiar and this person is touching something in us that compels us to, to be with them. Even if we went through I'll watch my language. Even if we went through a bad childhood, um, we might be drawn to partners that thematically and symbolically represent some of that bad stuff we went through. Mm -hmm. And unconsciously, we're trying to work that out. We're trying to gain mastery over the stuff that happened to us. Mm -hmm. And this relationship is the perfect testing ground to try and prove to ourselves that we can make it this time. Well, I think mm -hmm. to, to kind of hop on that, it's. You know, we often talk and when we look at dating, it's it's evaluating the other person and, and what they're doing and everything else, even with the idea of changing in the other person. If I have this strong desire or this strong irritation that this person is a slob and what's going on, it's also a perfect time for me to sit and reflect on myself and why this is such a big deal for me. Why, yes. why I'm pushing for this, why I have this desire, why am I unsettled with this thing that keeps happening in this relationship, has it happened in others? And so in, in dating, I think it's often important to sit back and reflect on myself. How am I on a first date? You know, what am I bringing to the table? What are the issues that I'm seeing? How much of that is me? How much do I share in that versus what's the other person? So then when I get that later on and I'm dealing with a couple that's been married for 20 years and they're doing the dance and it's all about, well, if my partner would just do this, mm -hmm. then I could, I could change and I could do this differently. And I often challenge them, I'm like, what if your partner stays the same? 
Is there anything that you could do differently? What if you changing inspires them to change, kind of accepting That's it? Great. What if now I back off, now how can this relationship? And either they continue that dance, and sometimes it can lead to divorce, or one person decides, you know what, I'm going to commit to do this thing differently, regardless of what my partner does. And it actually benefits the relationship and takes a lot of the conflict out. Interesting. See, my wife is severely OCD with cleaning. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, she's here today, actually. Right. And uh, for me, I do things 80% when it comes to cleaning, and she adds the other 1,000%. Right. <laughs> so, in a way, she understands my responsibly when it comes to daily chores and I know that whatever I do she's always have to come and redo it again right so but she understands me and I understand her right you know nice. and that's the most important thing is just to be able to find yeah. a good balance right you know the point of not judging the other person as bad is what mm -hmm. you're saying I think which is it's not that there's anything wrong with you not cleaning to her level and there's nothing wrong that she likes it that clean as long as she's not saying you're a slob do it like I want mm -hmm. or you're not saying stop it well, it's I heard too that much. before do it like, like <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's not how you do a dishwasher <laughs> right, right, right. it's wrong exactly oh, look at the angle it's 42 degrees that's actually 45 so right. but not to that extent but that's uh, this is interesting now Robin I wanted to uh, piggyback on what you said before sure. when it comes to if you do find the right uh, person okay what should you do to keep that relationship last long? Yeah. I mean, I know there's millions of things that you can do, but let's say you have a good vibe from that person. Yeah. What's the next step from this point forward? Yeah, well, my answer is, is informed from Gottman's work, uh, mm -hmm. as Tova referenced. Um, uh, if you're not familiar, I invite you, everyone watching, to, to Google John Gottman and mm -hmm. the Gottman Institute. Um, He's very doc good. Yeah, doctors John and Julie Gottman, and they, they studied thousands of couples, and. Um, there was no, th the results were not based on some, you know, philosophical approach, right? It was just like, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing what makes relationships last and what contributes to them dissolving. And so, uh, and it should be no surprise, it should make sense intuitively that what makes a relationship last is the strength of the friendship, right? To be with a partner, it's based on how safe you feel with this person and how much you trust this person. So when, um, Again, as, as people change over time, the communication channels need to be open for you to be able to be, to trust yourself and to trust your partner to be open and honest with your feelings and so that there can be a feedback loop so that you're not holding on to things or saying I'm changing privately and I'm you know, privately resenting my partner for not changing along with me, right? There's gotta be a communication channel open so that you can be yourself and um, and trust yourself to be open with your partner and, and communicate effectively. And again, uh, the effective communication, I mean, 95% of my intakes and the couples I work with, they say, we want to improve our communication. Well, great, well, what's, let's peel that back. What's underneath <laughs> of that? Um, but what, what contributes to relationships dissolving are what Gottman refers to as the four horsemen, yeah, right? Horsemen. Which are criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, stonewalling and contempt. Um, and so, um, you know, I think I think what what the couple really needs to be able to do is to uh, check in with themselves, and if something doesn't feel right, it's it's a good idea to turn towards your spouse. And 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 not everyone can do this, right? Uh, that's why relationship therapists exist. It's it's not pathological to um, to say I, I I need some help. That's okay, um, but. Uh, I hope I answered your question. Sometimes no, I tend to ramble. You know, yeah. I'd like to add, if that's okay, uh, when you said that you need to feel safe with your partner, one of the things the Gottmans noticed, though, is that there isn't, like, you know, the idea to feel safe means that everyone's talking really nicely. Well, they said, no, some couples are volatile. Yeah. Their communication style is screaming at each other, <laughs> but that doesn't mean they feel unsafe. Right. Because they understand that they're still mm. safe in that relationship, and they know that they're going to make up and they're going to get through it. They don't mind yelling. It's harder when you have one who likes, who doesn't mind the yelling and one who minds the yelling and mm -hmm. gets triggered by it. But it doesn't mean that feeling safe in a relationship means everyone's like being really thoughtful, like, how does it make you feel? I feel you know, it really means that, you know, you know that you're safe even if voices get raised, even if you're a high conflict couple. There are couples that are high conflict couples, but they don't have the four uh, terrible traits that make marriages not work. Yeah, but now that 50% of marriages end up in divorce, is it because they do not understand each other? Do they not interact or communicate properly? Because there must be a, a disconnect somewhere where they do not, they no longer understand each other for them to say, you know what, it's not worth pursuing this. 
So, and 50% in America, I mean, this isn't probably, yeah. and that doesn't mean that those who are together are happy. Right. Yeah. So there's another That's 25% right. that is not. So what do, how do we resolve this? They lose interest too. I've had some couples come see me just in communicating. They have nothing to say to each other, but what the kids are doing, let's say during the day. So I help them get in touch with each other's feelings more and just learn more. We do active li listening exercises to really listen to each other and then say, tell me more and just be more empathetic because some, yeah, there's, there are quite a few couples who have been married for such a long time and they don't have that connection anymore because they forgot how to connect, how to engage with, with each other. They're just so busy with their kids and work. They forgot about each other to be friends. I, I think it also has to do with, you know, um, when you're dating, when you're considering getting married, what are you committing to? And so oftentimes I have couples that, you know, say they're committing to each other, but we're only genuinely committing to their feelings. Mm -hmm. I feel this positive way about you. I feel happy with you. And so we're going to go, but then we have kids and we have work and I'm no longer happy with you. Well, I find being away from you, I'm happier. So I'm going to pursue that. Well, then what did you ultimately commit to in the beginning? you just committed to how you were feeling and the feelings that were coming in and everything else. And there has to mm. be some type of standard that's bigger than your feelings. Feelings are mm. fleeting. Feelings change on a regular and consistent basis. Mm -hmm. What are we committing to in this relationship? And oftentimes I get couples that are struggling in their marriage and everything else. And it's like, we're not happy. I was like, if anyone ever told you that you're gonna be happy <laughs> your entire time in marriage, they were out of their mind. <laughs> I've, I've been angrier at my wife than I've been at any human being ever uh, interacted with before. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you get to that point? Mm -hmm. How do you resolve it? What are you working toward? What is your standard? Are we gonna commit to communicating? How are we gonna communicate? So I can be ha unhappy with you on Monday, but we're gonna come back to our standard on Tuesday or Wednesday, because maybe we can't talk that evening, mm -hmm. and we're gonna try to work this out. But if it's just based on my feelings, then I can leave, right? At the, at the end of the day, yeah. I'm not, mm -hmm. and I can find happiness in somebody else. That's oftentimes what I get, especially with the mm. infidelity, is that, oh, this feels good, I'm, I'm happy, I'm enjoying this. But, I mean, the same kind of triggers that are triggered through the use of cocaine can be triggered be in an unfaithful relationship with somebody else. Of course you're gonna be happy. You're high off the rush yes, of the feelings and everything else. And of course it's gonna feel mm. worse with your spouse. I mean, riding a roller coaster is better than sitting in rush hour traffic, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna to wanna to ride the roller coaster. But when you start riding that roller coaster, your feelings change again, you're unhappy again, and you're doing it all over again. Hmm. Very, very good point. Anyone want to? Uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just say um, uh, just a little bit about happiness. It's um, it seems to be a really hard lesson to learn, and a lot of people don't learn it, which is that um, I'll be happy once this happens. Oh, once I find someone, then I'll be happy. Once I once I get to own a house, then I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. It's always the the chase, right? Like once I once I graduate from college, I'll be happy. And, and then once those things are attained, uh, the, the happy, you get to be happy for an hour or you get to be happy for a day, right? We're, but we're always moving forward. We're always chasing something. And so there's always, you know, that's why there, that's why there are people that have it all and are miserable, mm -hmm. right? Possessions are not, fi financial success, that doesn't equal mm -hmm. happiness. Mm -hmm. Happiness means I'm okay with what I have. We have people in abject poverty who show all the signs of happiness, right? So. So to recognize that what you're chasing because you think once you get it, you'll then be happy, that is flawed. And mm -hmm. happiness exists as cheesy and cliche as it sounds, happiness exists within. Happiness is something that you have to find within yourself when you accept yourself and you accept your life. But then why in the U.S. they do <laughs> say the pursuit of happiness? Mm -hmm. Then it's a pursuit that never really ends. So you're going to be here and your American dream will never be reached. Yeah. Well, I think it, it depends how you're defining happiness. So if your pursuit of happiness is defined as your pursuit of more money or a bigger <coughs> house or a fancier whatever, um, that's how you're choosing to define. That's a cultural kind of thing we've gotten really stuck in here mm -hmm. in our Western culture. That happiness, if you ask them, your average person, what's happiness? Oh, I would get to have the big house. I'd get to have lots of travel. I'd, all this stuff they don't say uh, well I'll be really connected with my wife or my husband <laughs> and we'll have a great conversation and that, you know that's not what people are looking for but I think to your other question if I may about um, the divorce rate I think it's really complicated because uh, I was divorced I was married for seven years and then divorced and dated in my 30s and then uh, married again for now 14 years and I can say that um, divorce isn't always bad <laughs> In fact, uh, when people used to come and say, I'd say I'm divorced, they say, I'm so sorry. 
I'd say, I'm not, I'm <laughs> thrilled. You know, divorce can sometimes really, if you, if you ma made a decision when you were pretty young to marry somebody and it wasn't a good decision, thank goodness today, in today's world, you're not stuck for the rest of your life. That's true. You know, but if you don't want to make the same mistake over and over again, you got to figure out your part. You got to figure out what put me, what made me make those decisions. I had to figure out what made me make those decisions, end up in a marriage that did not work for me at all. And what do I need to do differently so I don't repeat it? Because we actually know that second marriages are more likely to fail than first marriages. 72%. And so what can I do differently so that I don't, what can I change about me? What did I bring to it in my part of the equation? And I think then if you do that kind of work, you can really approach dating and approach marriage in a different way. But then if we go with the 72% rate of divorce on the second marriage, don't people learn from the mistake and they do everything in their power not to fall in that 72% range? Because I mean, if I did one thing and that caused a divorce, why, why will I do it again? But, but I think they usually think it was the other person's fault when they get divorced. Mm, okay. I think, I, th I mean, I, I'm sure, yeah. you know, they usually, go ahead. It, it, it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I just I, found the wrong person. Right, I just found the wrong person and I'm not picking, mm -hmm. you know, right. the right person. And, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, because you talk about happiness and but happiness in a capitalistic society is marketable <laughs> so you can buy this other thing and you can be happy you Couple see pills, it in commercials yeah. Open this happiness. Is, right this right. is going to be happiness i mean with all the prescription drug medication yeah. i can be happy i'm going to have diarrhea and bleeding but i'll be happy <laughs> I'll be all the side right right all the side effects of it and i'll be happy and even you're finding that i was reading an article earlier this week about the dating apps and the tinder or plenty of fish or whatever you're looking at it's i'll go out on this date I'll enjoy it, the person will be fun. But there's like a hundred more people on, on here. And maybe the next one, I could be even happier than I am now and mm -hmm. even more enjoyable. So you have people that are serial daters because there's plenty of fish out there and you're going <laughs> and you're looking at them and you just kind of keep going. I'm married. What am I missing out on? What about the opportunities? What about all the other people that could be my soulmate or my perfect person? So now I can end my marriage and go do it again. Well, this one was a little bit better. It wasn't as bad <laughs> as my first wife. I can do it again. <laughs> I've already done this thing that used to be this cultural taboo and I've gotten a divorce. What's another one? You know, I'm five marriages in now and you know, this person ultimately is better than the first one. And so people, I have folks that come in that eventually, you know what, I really need to do some work on myself because I'm realizing, you know, 20 years down the line that a lot of this has to do with me and that the next one isn't going right. to make me happy. It takes all those bad ones before they realize I really need to do some work on me. I'm not finding happiness outside of myself. That's not the way I'm going to find it. when you it. become like Elizabeth Taylor who got married nine times, <laughs> right. then you know there's a problem and the common denominator is you. Right. 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 Or yourself. the money that you get when the marriage ends. Yes. <laughs> That's another thing. Exactly. <laughs> now, um, Tova, what would you say... Um, what does a perfect relationship look like for you when you were at your second, when you dated in your mm -hmm. 30s? What did you look for specifically? I know I'm, I'm targeting you, yeah, but no, that's okay. that yeah. could not be similar to everyone yeah. else, but what would you say was when you say, wait, well, he's the right one? You know, it's interesting. So first of all, I still believe in magic. Like there is such a thing as love and connection and you meet someone and you really click with them. So for me, that that just had to be there. I'm not saying it had to like hit you over the head, but just like fun together and like a, a certain um, magical feeling, mm -hmm. you know, that, that it's really nice to start off with, but it's, that's not enough. Doesn't um, last. Yeah. It's, yeah. And you, I think if you're married a long time, I've been married now 14 years, you know, you have moments where you recapture, but day to day life, it's really important to have a partner someone and you know I don't think your partner can give you everything you know we expect them to be our best friend perfect lover perfect co-parent perfect work partner all those kinds of things and I think you know we should have friendships outside the marriage we should have things that we love to do and get mm -hmm. energy from other places too mm -hmm. <laughs> but a deep friendship and a commitment to building something together to being kind to each other um, and then when things go really bad which they will to be able to remember the positive about the other person, mm -hmm. remember your own weaknesses. So I think it's just a constant, you know, it's constantly working on yourself and the other person and remembering to be kind. The Gottmans also talked about a ratio 
Was it five to one? Yeah, well, it's, it's five to one and 20 to one, depending on whether there are, things are going, <laughs> going well, well or not. So the five to one ratio means that in every relationship there's conflict. But the question is, how much good to bad interaction mm -hmm. is there? Mm -hmm. That's a good one, yeah. So in every relationship you have plenty of bad, but in good relationships you have a lot more good. Don't Agreed. expect to ever to erase the bad stuff, but know that if you do really, my husband always puts a glass of water by my bedside, no matter what kind of day we had. Just a little act of love to make me feel like I matter to him. Things like that, mm -hmm. you know, really add up. So what is your love language? Care you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was I mean, a words, but also, you know, just like a little thing like that. But also, for me, it's funny, I was, you know, a single mom for a long time. So for me, when he can do stuff like take the kids to appointments or do stuff like that, it makes me feel mm -hmm. very cared about. And he knows okay. that, so he does it when he can. Acts of service, yeah. definitely. Acts of service, Acts of service. Yeah. Yeah. Like Words it. are nice, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what I what I've figured as well, a good exercise is when you're really angry with your significant other, mm -hmm. is to be able to, each and every one of you, go your separate ways before anger right. augments. Yes. And, uh, and then just write about the best thing that you like about that person. Mm. <coughs> and just to be able to remember nice. the reason why you're fighting. And then that kind of uh, actually resolve and calm you down in a way mm -hmm. where you say, you know what? The fight really has no purpose, has no meaning, because I like all of these things about him or her. Mm -hmm. That assumes that, that the person can compartmentalize. So that assumes that when the fight is happening and then they both go their separate ways to take a break and calm down and cool off, that eventually they can access those positive interactions, right? Some people can't, or some people have a harder time doing it because they're not actually calming down. They're mm -hmm. not self-soothing. Mm -hmm. So oh, they yes. take a break, mm -hmm. and while they, they're going to go out for a, f a walk uh, for fresh air, and while on their walk, they're like, I don't deserve to be treated this way. <laughs> they're <laughs> ruminating. Yeah, they're, they're ruminating. Yeah, so they're accentuates. not accessing it. So th they've got to be able to calm the nervous system down first. Okay. There's, okay. Yeah, you, you want to add Yeah, on? I'm sorry. Yeah. So the stop technique is great. You, you step back from what's happening so you don't react. You take three deep breaths. I always say take three deep breaths. So you get in tune to how you feel inside, where, what these feelings are doing inside and what's happening. Um, ST. Observe what's going on <coughs> inside of your body and then perceive yourself and others with compassion. Step back when you're about to yell at somebody. Yeah. With anyone, with your kids. And then, and then it gives you, you know, a different way of looking at it. You get out of your head. Right. The more time you're in your head and you ruminate, <coughs> that's, where, that's where a lot of problems happen. And I think, I mean, every relationship that I've, I've found that I've worked with, there's the... Uh, the peacekeeper and and the pursuer and so mm -hmm. sometimes it's the male or the female or whatever it doesn't matter it's not gender specific and so oftentimes the peacekeeper gets resent resentful that I'm the one that's always attempting to broker peace mm -hmm. that I'm the one that's always attempting to do that and I, I, I kind of challenge them in that you know you bring something to the relationship that is vital to the relationship you have that role you know, you're capable, you have the strength to kind of put those feelings aside, engage in a dialogue, and come from a different perspective. And so you can help your partner in a lot of ways by being that peacekeeper, being that pursuer, being the person that can get to a calm place, accept fault for what's your fault and your responsibility, and try to engage in a dialogue around how we can do this thing different. Um, each relationship has one. They, they vary in degree and strength in how they do it, but it's recognizing who's the peacekeeper and the peacekeeper recognizing, I serve a vital role in this relationship. There's two of us here. I'm the one that's better able to do this. That doesn't make me better than my partner, but I can bring something to the relationship that's going to benefit both of us. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to love and care in that way. But then to that point, that's actually a very, very important and interesting point. Where do you become a doormat? And where do you say, you know what, I think I kind of like um, let go of my own happiness for theirs. Right. Mm -hmm. So when do you say, you know what, hey, enough is enough. I'm the one who always bent forward and backward for you and you never make the effort. And then the other person will feel that, yeah, you know what, he, he'll do everything I want. Just if I raise my voice, he'll feel guilty and then he's just going to accept his own responsibilities. There's a distinction. Okay. What Peace is keeper, it? not peacemaker. Peacemaker is the doormat that just whatever at any cost, any sacrifice no to conflict, myself, right. yep. no conflict, I'm mm -hmm. just going to get out of the way and whatever it is, I'm going to suck it up, I'll be resentful about it or whatever, I'm, I'm just going in. The peacekeeper is about brokering peace and that peace is only going to be brokered if I'm articulating my feelings, I'm being heard as well, in addition to hearing your feelings. The peacekeeper just initiates that process and seeks to have dialogue, conversation, and deal with that conflict. 
but the peacemaker is just we're just gonna you know that was the kid that cleaned up and put everything in the closet and called the room clean you don't want to be a peacemaker <laughs> but a peacekeeper it's it's there who can broker a conversation that can get us to a better place in this relationship in this conflict who can put pride aside accept responsibility for their part of it and you know be able to push forward and engage in that dialogue so i guess i'm the peacekeeper right <laughs> <laughs> okay now i know thank you for the definition right. i was you're, not you're sure which one was a, falling I love, under i've not heard the use of those terms and i love it because i think i think it's tricky you know i think it's you know couples have the same fight over and over again in different ways it might seem like it's different but ultimately it's about who gets to decide in this relationship who has power and control in this relationship and um, mm -hmm. there is often you know there's uh, some relationships don't even have a lot of conflict because one person always gives in does that mean that's a good relationship not necessarily no. and it's not sustainable to always give in and to never have anything you get too empty that way and so I think it's really hard to learn and I, I really love that I'm gonna use yes. that mm -hmm. so thank you yeah. so <laughs> would you say that a peacekeeper can become eventually a peacemaker um, a peacekeeper can default to peacemaker depending on what's going on and how challenging the situation is and look I'm I think sometimes you can make peace in your relationship can I bite the bullet on this one can Please, I just can I just take being wrong even though I'm not <laughs> wrong can I just accept it in this instance for the sake of moving forward can I address this in a time of peace when we're at a better place or whatever but for the sake of dampening tensions right now can I just okay I'm wrong in other words, stop the right fighting. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this thing we call right fighting where you, everyone's trying to prove they're right. And I always say, who, you know, if one person's right, the other person's wrong and mm -hmm. everybody loses. That's right. right? Yes. right? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wins a right fight. Right. So biting the bullet is saying, okay, fine, you want to be right? And I, yeah, I do that. Right. I, or yeah. even being able to not just give to them that they're right, except that they're having a strong emotional reaction to something. Mm -hmm. That's a genuine thing that's mm -hmm. taking place inside of them mm -hmm. and accept that you played a role in that. Mm -hmm. Whether you intended mm -hmm. to or mm -hmm. not, your partner is in some form of distress because of something they're unhappy about and you played a role in that. Be able to take responsibility for your role in that and have a dialogue about that. Even if ultimately you are right, <laughs> right? It, it's not mm -hmm. standing on mm -hmm. that right now. Mm. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I hurt you. I really meant to be there on time. I was trying to traffic something or other, but you know what? I'm, I'm sorry. I'll bite the bullet for that. Mm -hmm. That's that's nice. yeah, that's that's such an important point. Uh, for I mean, it, it relates to when you're in a relationship and when conflict is happening. Being able to see what part did I play? How how have I contributed to this cycle of escalation? Right. But it also relates to what we were talking about before with second marriages and divorce. And it's like how come people can't figure out what's going on? It's really easy to blame the other person. It's really easy. Much harder to look at yourself and say what did I do that contributed to that first marriage falling apart? What was my role that I played? That exercise is so important to use in all relationships, in business relationships. I mean, it's just, it's a healthy thing to do and it's a hard thing to do, but it's, it's worth paying attention to, for sure. Interesting. Uh, Marilyn, when it comes to being heard in a, you know, mm -hmm. like in a partnership, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned as well about people get along I mean they when they yell they this is their way mm -hmm. to discuss about things but more one person yell the other person will have to yell harder Louder. to be able to get hurt exactly <laughs> right. so when to that point where mm -hmm. do the communication breaks when it comes to like wanting to talk to the other person you want to get hurt mm -hmm. but then the, other, the person doesn't listen mm -hmm. right it's usually like we, we talked about this last time dirty laundry like just the term dirty laundry it usually has to do with other things that maybe they're fighting about right that second. There's like things that accumulated and people have suppressed their emotions and not talked about things right away when they needed to. So it's good to express your feelings and not to blame the other one or criticize the other one, but say, I feel this way because this just happened, you know, and just let's talk about this, you know, and not to yell at the other person. And I always say, you know, speak nicely and, and, and compliment the person, you know, every day or say, you know, I'm grateful for this. And instead of looking for things to go wrong, whatever you look for is going to happen. You're going to see more of it. If you look for things bad in the relationship, you're just going to get more of it. But you look for the good stuff and be grateful for the good stuff and savor. Yes. I help people the savoring moment. raisins the and all that, right? We do that. Exactly. But savoring the moment, savoring life, savoring your time together and talk about it, how grateful you are. 
then the relationship can just blossom more. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly it. Now, um, in your therapy services, do you uh, focus a lot on the lo five love languages from Chapman? Because if you understand the other person about what is their love languages, does that help? the most in the relationship. Yeah, I've 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 integrated it, I would say with, you know, a handful of cases. I it's not my go-to, but when when I see it as uh, pertinent or when it when, when something's happening in session and it emerges and I'm like I'm thinking in that way and I'm like aha here's what's going on I'll present it with couples and um, some will find it useful others will, will won't so it, it's not for everyone but I think Gary Chapman was definitely on to something in terms of being able to know well this is this is how this gets back to what I was saying before about how we were raised this is how my family of origin showed love mm -hmm. this is how I knew that I was deserving of love or worthy of love. This is how people showed they care about me. So this is, I've been socialized that way, so this is what I scan for and this is how I know. And then, so you have that person and then the other person in the relationship, well, my family showed love by physical touch, right? Or my family showed love by giving gifts, but we never said it, right? So when we have these two families of origins, they're different templates and now these two people wanna build a life together, they've gotta understand those differences. When e and every, I mean, it's not just love languages. No two people speak exactly the same language. Mm -hmm. You know, no two people were raised in this. Even siblings weren't really raised in the same home because one was an older brother, one was a younger brother, sister, you know. And so I think really comes to, it's love language, but it's also all language. We, you know, what means to, I went one time on one of those dates, we went to see a movie. And we walked out of the movie, and before I could say, wow, that was unbelievable movie, the guy said to me, well, that was a complete waste of time. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe this whole date was a complete waste of time. <laughs> so was that a red flag for it you? Was yeah. a, it was, it told me that we really spoke such a different language mm -hmm. that there really wasn't enough common ground that we were, you know, we might as well have been speaking Italian and French. Mm -hmm. And Toby, you, you mentioned magic earlier about like that, mm -hmm. that, that that was there in the beginning of the relationship. Mm -hmm. I think it related to something you said, Philip, about um, uh, that people just always want to chase that high, I guess, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that I thought about the difference between the passionate love and companionate love. So mm -hmm. there's different kinds of love curves and people who are serial daters who keep finding this new person who is this exciting thing and it's triggering something in them and it's so exciting. This is the passionate love and we all experience it and it never lasts. It doesn't pay off for the long term. Right. It, it can't be, it's not sustainable. So that's, that curve is gonna dip and when passionate love goes down, something else needs to keep this ship afloat. That's companionate love and that's the friendship that I was talking about earlier. You, you've got to have a good friendship for your mm -hmm. romantic relationship to last. Interesting. Anyone here in the audience would like to be able to share their own uh, experience? I mean, we've shared so much information and I'm sure that something probably triggered in you that was either good or bad or uh, living through personal experiences or anything of that sort. Yes, please. as the panel has pointed out, that sometimes with the issue you have to fix somebody. I tend to be a bit of a control freak, mm -hmm. type A personality, I guess. Um, and I was wondering if uh, the panel had mentioned uh, looking inward uh, and also you know, working with the other person in the romantic relationship. Don't accept them for who they are, don't try to fix them. Is there a point where um, you would you recommend in your field of experience where the person should be single and what they should be looking for being single what questions should they ask themselves to you know uh, to uh, I guess remedy whatever um, issues or, or problems there are in themselves when looking for a romantic relationship does that make sense? yeah yeah it totally does. you got one can minute can to I answer that question yeah we have to wrap up <laughs> oh, oh go ahead I, I think it's important to understand that you're probably not just attempting to control things in your romantic relationships, that it probably shows up in other relationships yeah. at work. You know, sometimes at work, I can be the boss where I'm supposed to control things and that feels good, there's no issues. And so I think really digging down to where does that come from? Why is that something that you struggle with? Why does being in control kind of um, permeate the different areas of your life and what would it mean to relinquish That's that great. control 
um, to somebody else. This, yeah. is, it, is it about making yourself vulnerable is going to be challenging for you and really begin to investigate that. And in investigating that, I'd say, yes, be single. Um, and then as you do some work on that and figure that out, then try getting into dating again with a new set of tools that you've now learned from being single because the chances are you're going to go back to being controlling in the next relationship. Well, uh, sorry, can I have a follow-up yeah, question for you, Doug? Okay. Thank, thank you. Afterwards. Afterwards. Yeah. I'm so yeah. sorry. <laughs> thank you. You'll be able to all go and ask them a question. Um, well, folks, that's all the time we have for today. Um, I would like to thank Marilyn, Phil, Tova, and Robin for their time. Their contact information will be, will be provided um, below on the lower third of the screen and also at the credits at the end of the show. I would like to also thank the audience for attending our seminar today instead of laying down by the pool or the beach. Now, thanks to all again for being here today. I really appreciate it. You made this panel a lot more interesting. Now, here's the concluding words of wisdom. Now, what is my kind of relationship? Now, I love being in the type of relationship where you can totally be comfortable around each other and there is no pressure to act a certain way. There are no awkward moments. You can be weird and lazy when you want to or be together. Make fun at each other. Take all each other and then just laugh it off like you are the best friends, because in reality, you are. Now, a relationship where you can call each other nicknames, accompanied by annoying sounds, and where there are lots and lots of laughing in the time you spend together. But you can also and very rarely be serious. You can just be yourself with the comfort of knowing what the other person loves the most, and it is you. So when you do find someone like that, you did find Mr. or Mrs. Wright. My name is Dr. Dan Emzalag, and have yourself a wonderful journey in your search of that special someone. Thank you very much.